Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, I don't know if you've ever gone to the website called Babylon B, but it's kind of a humorous Christian satire website where they make like fake news articles that kind of poke fun at some, some silly Christian stereotypes. And there was one, this I probably caught my eye maybe a year or so ago, and this was the title of the article. Now remember, this isn't like a real news article. Man sitting literally three feet away from Bible asks God to speak to him. And the article starts like this. According to sources, local man Steve Harris, and I apologize if that refers to anybody by name, it's not intentional, fervently prayed Thursday that the Lord would speak to him and make his will for the man's life clear, all while sitting literally three feet from God's word as revealed in the Bible. Kind of funny, but also a bit true. See, in the world of humor, satire has always been a vehicle to talk about something uncomfortable and true with a little bit of levity. Because it's true that we do, in fact, ourselves look for answers from God, often in the wrong places and often right next to where he's already given us those answers. And if you've ever been in that position It's not great fun because you feel lost and confused and all the while God is beckoning to you through his word, through the congregation you're in, etc., etc. But the truth is that often when we think of God, we're hoping for something a bit flashier, a vision, a dream, something that's going to make everything so clear and yet we get a book that we have to open and read. But there's a reason that it's important for us to open that book. Because the answers are in there, and as I shared with the kids, that is the word which makes things so. God's word is efficacious. In other words, it does what it says. Our text today in Mark chapter 7 really demonstrates this with an almost absurd and hilarious example. This text appears at first glance like any other healing miracle of Jesus. We're we're familiar with that now. He healed people who were paralyzed, who were blind, who were sick, and in this case, deaf and had problems speaking. And so a group of people, presumably this man's friends or relatives, they hear that Jesus does this stuff, that he heals people. And so they bring this man who has been deaf from birth and has a speech impediment because they think that Jesus can heal him. And then Jesus does something interesting. He takes him aside privately, and he puts his fingers in his ears, and then spits and touches his tongue. Now, at first, that seems super odd to us, and a bit gross, right? I can see some people out there, "Uh I don't really want Jesus to do that. Anything else but not that, thank you. But is it really all that odd? I mean, think about when you go to the doctor. Jesus is the great physician, after all. The doctor pokes and prods you in ways that isn't really appropriate for anyone else and sometimes is uncomfortable and weird, and they're asking you about stuff that could potentially be gross. They stick that thing in your ear so they can look in there. They hit you in the knee with that thing to test your reflexes, right? And they'll say, does this hurt? Does this hurt? Does this hurt? So one of the reasons that Jesus does this is He's assuring this person who can't hear anything by touching where he's going to heal. And he's behaving a lot like a physician. Nowadays, we have tongue depressors and latex gloves and instruments that shine lights in ears. But when Jesus was walking the earth, they didn't have any of those things. Yet the strange thing is Jesus does these two actions, and yet still there is no healing. So these actions of touching the ear and the tongue don't actually do anything as far as the healing goes because there's some key ingredient missing, and that is his word. So after Jesus does these actions, he sighs and says, Ephatha, which is the Aramaic word that means be opened, and it's a command. 
And the amazing thing here is the deaf man hears Jesus. And his ears are opened. And his tongue is loosened. Now imagine you were a witness to that. And especially if you're somebody who knew this man for his entire life. And so you knew the struggles that he had, that it wasn't an act, it wasn't pretend. And then all of a sudden this guy fixes all of that just by saying, Ephatha. That would be an incredible sight to behold. Even the fake healers of our day attract crowds of thousands and tens of thousands because people desire and look for these sorts of miracles. And when they happen, they are incredible. But then Jesus does something quite puzzling. And this is really a theme throughout the book of Mark that we'll get into here in a moment. But he then turns to these people who are now on fire about what they just witnessed Jesus do and says, don't tell anyone about it. And it says that he charges them. So he's commanding them. He's saying, do not tell anyone about this. Okay. So the messianic secret is the way that the, uh, the academic world refers to this theme in Mark. That there's numerous places in Mark where Jesus does healings and miracles and he tells the crowds and he tells the unclean spirits which he casts out to not speak about who he is. To not bear witness to the things that he has done. Now we're not 100% sure exactly why. There are, some, there are numerous thoughts on this. The, the two main thoughts are that Jesus wants to control the time by which he becomes notorious in the eyes of the religious leaders so as not to inhibit his ministry. So if, if everybody starts going around saying Jesus is an amazing guy and he does these amazing things that only someone from God can do, pretty soon he's going to run into the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the priests and the problems that he does eventually run into later. But the second one is, and I think probably the more likely in this case, is that he doesn't want people to misunderstand why he's here. Now, if you remember a couple weeks ago, we were preaching in John 6, and after, and the setup for John 6 is the feeding of the 5,000, this amazing miracle. And what did the people want to do after Jesus made all this fish and bread? They wanted to make him the bread king. They wanted to make him a king so that they would never go hungry. And you can easily see the connection to healing miracles. That, oh, they think that the reason Jesus is here is to fix all of our bodily ailments and wrongs. And that's not why he's here. His mercy is so great for his creation that he doesn't disdain to do those things, but that is not the reason for which he's come. That is not the real enemy he has come to defeat. So, for reasons we don't fully know, Jesus tells the people who brought this man to him to tell nobody about this act of healing. Well, what happens when he tells them to do that? They don't listen. Right? That's sort of the irony of the text here is the only person who listens to God's word is the deaf guy. And all the people who can hear don't listen. So Jesus charges them not to tell. And the text even says that the more he charges them not to, the more zealously they wish to proclaim it and do proclaim it. So it's sort of like when people will say, well, now that you've told me not to do it, I want to do it a lot more. But before we get to on their case about blatantly ignoring Jesus' words, let's take a little look in the mirror, because you do this, and so do I. Especially when we think we know better. I mean, consider the possible motivations behind them wanting to spread the news about this, right? This is going to, you know, I know you're telling me not to say this, Jesus, but you'll thank me later, right? This is really going to grow your following of people. You're looking for disciples. And that was sort of the tradition of the rabbis, right? If you were a, no, if you were a notable teacher and people liked your stuff, then you would gain more followers. So maybe some of those people are thinking, I'm going to do this guy a favor. I know he doesn't want me to do it, but he'll thank me later. Or... They might think that this is an amazing gift. This is a great thing you've done. People should know about it. 
Those seem like good motivations to me. They seem to benefit Jesus. But the truth is that whatever their motivation is, they're all disobeying a direct charge from Jesus. Presumably, Jesus has his reasons for why he doesn't want this being told. And yet, because they think they know better, they disobey. And they all the more wish to tell others what Jesus has done. It's a very odd thing to be talking about from the pulpit of a Christian church. The idea that Jesus is saying, don't tell people about me and what I do. But when was the last time that you did this? When you came across a part of scripture or a teaching from God's word, and you thought, "Eh, you know, I know better than that. Maybe your reason was, well, that used to be true, but God, he just isn't with the times. If he was around today, he would say this. Or maybe it is, um, you know, I know what he says, but that's not really what I think is loving or not what I think is right. In other words, the voice of the world then takes over in the place of the voice of God. We all do this. In essence, every time we sin, we practice some form of this pretend world where we know better than God. And we try to redefine the rules We try to pretend that we know better. Even when our motivations seem so great. I'm helping you out, Jesus. This is really going to help out. Rather than trust in what God has given us in his word. Our theology of vocation in the Lutheran church is a perfect example of this reality. So we talk about the theology of vocation. The word vocation means like a calling from God. And often the vocational calling that God gives you, it's boring. It's not flashy. It doesn't gain you a lot of notoriety. And some of the greatest vocations fall into that category. One that comes to mind is uh, the vocation of Christian parents. Often that's dirty, ignominious work. You don't get thanked for that. Nobody else knows the kind of effort and toil that goes into it. And yet... It is some of the most holy work of God's people. To the point where Luther even has a quote where he says that the changing of a dirty diaper is a holier work than all of the work done in the monasteries in Europe. Because it's an explicit obedience to a command from God. Because it's following this word that does what it says. That it doesn't presume to know more than Jesus but does what, Jesus, does what Jesus asks. Well, I have good news for you. This word that does what it says, it said a few things to you. And here's what it said. There's an easy part, and there's a little bit harder part. The easy part is this. Your sins are forgiven. In baptism, you are my child. In the Lord's Supper, my body and blood are given for you for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will live forever with me. That's great to hear from the word that makes things happen. Because what that means is that despite sometimes when I feel like I'm sinful and unworthy of God's affection, his word makes it so. The forgiveness is true and real because the God of the world says so in his word. But here comes the slightly harder part. This same word also says this, go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them. Teach them all I have commanded you. And then he adds a nice easy part at the end. I am with you always. You see, in our text today, Jesus gave the people that witnessed this miracle a charge. He charged them to tell no one about him because it was not yet time for his true purpose to be revealed. But God has given a charge to you and me as well. Fortunately, it is not tell no one about me and what I do. In fact, it is the opposite. Jesus charges each and every one of us 
to go and make disciples. To bring them to the waters of baptism. For them to be baptized by the church. And for them to be taught this very word by which they are granted faith. That's an amazing gift. That's why each week when we read God's word, even if it's something that makes us squirm in our seats a little bit, our response is the, th- is the same. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Because we recognize that word as the wondrous great gift it is. Now, just like those people in the text, there are still going to be times where you go out and you think you know better. And there are going to be times where I go out and think I know better. And I'm going to put my foot in my mouth and so are you. And we're going to do something that we need to come back then the next week and include that in our confession of sins. But then we get to experience the joy again of God's word that does what it says. And hear that blessed promise of forgiveness. Life forever. And that our relationship has been forever changed with God because of what Jesus has done. So dear brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus is charging you. He's saying, go and make disciples of all nations. Bring people to the waters of baptism and teach them the things that I have commanded you. That's his charge to the church. And so we go forth confidently living under his grace to do that very thing to the best of our ability to obey what he has called us to do and listen to his word. And when we falter and fall, that very same word speaks the reality of the forgiveness won through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and the reality that we have life forever with him. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until he comes again to make everything new. Amen.